Uh, well, it's great to present for this group. John, thank you for the uh, introduction. And a lot of this work is in close collaboration with uh, John's lab. So uh, I was going to talk about um, how epigenetics actually may control uh, genetics. Um, so throughout this meeting, uh, there are multiple talks uh, pointing to the importance of genetic variation in understanding of epigenetic landscape. So there is a lot of justifiable interest in how genetics controls epigenetics. Uh, so briefly, all the studies can be summarized as take your favorite epigenetic feature, uh, QTL studies, right? So you, you have eQTLs, methylation QTLs, chromatin accessibility QTLs, uh, all types of QTLs. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we believe that understanding the effect of genetic variation on epigenetic features can um, uh, <clears throat> allow us to go a long way uh, in understanding the mechanism of disease association, the, the biology, and so forth. Uh, however, we're interested in, in, in the inverse problem, is what is the effect of epigenomic landscape on genetics? And one of these effects is how epigenomic landscape controls mutation, right? Because the source of variation is, is mutation. So what we've been doing, we've been looking at data on uh, mutations, both in germline context. So we have now sequencing data for multiple trios and, and quads. Uh, I wouldn't be talking about this today. Uh, and somatic mutations, constant somatic mutations, where so these are differences between parents and children, where changes are happening in the DNA. And here, differences are between um, usually blood, some control cell type, and cancer cell. Uh, so this is the idea, and the idea is to see what are the effects um, of epigenetic variables on this uh, changes in, in the DNA sequence. Why are we interested? So we're interested for multiple reasons. Um, one interest is in statistical and medical genetics fields because understanding of mutation rate models would uh, inform methods for gene mapping, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, another big interest of ours is evolutionary biology, and there are two reasons we care uh, from evolutionary biology perspective. One is that mutation rate is a key parameter in a lot of evolutionary models, right? If we want to infer selection, if we want to understand differences between populations, different differences between species, um, date, speciation events, we have to uh, have some understanding of mutation rate. Uh, the other interest is evolution of mutation rate itself, right? Because cell controls mutational events, and mutation rate is one phenotype which is under selection. Uh, so the question now is not only why mutation rate is what it is, but um, so not only what, uh, what is mutation rate, but why um, is mutation rate what it is. Uh, also, there is, of course, interest uh, from biology perspective, biology of DNA repair, and biology of DNA replication. So I'll, uh, for maybe a couple minutes, talk about statistical genetics piece of, uh, 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 of work. Uh, so there is a growing interest in gene mapping using de novo mutations. There are two areas specifically. It's uh, genetics of neuropsychiatric diseases and cancer genomics. And the idea here is to map genes involved in disease progression or cancer driver genes um, using recurrence. So this is not your classic genetic mapping. Uh, for example, LD-based association or linkage. Uh, this is mapping using uh, mutations, and this is the only mapping strategy uh, which is possible to do in asexual systems. Uh, the idea is very simple. You find different patients carrying mutations in the same gene, collapse them by gene, and you can make an inference that this is a significantly mutated gene. Right, there are more mutations than you expect. Now, the big question is, uh, what do you actually expect? Right? Because in these studies, you cannot run case control. You cannot really look at how many mutations in this gene happens in cases versus how many in controls, because you would lack statistical power to do so. So the idea is uh, to do some sort of model. So for example, the simplest approach, and this is um, was used in early papers on the subject. You take some estimate of genomic mutation rate using independent samples. 
then you evaluate probability to observe recurrent events in a given gene, correct for multiple testing, right? So why this is not the correct strategy? Because if you have heterogeneity among samples, especially problem in cancer genomics, where you have one, some samples basically filled with mutations, others um, have uh, much lower mutation densities, uh, you will make fallacious um, inferences and uh, this mapping will generate a lot of false positives. Uh, so there is another strategy. Another strategy is the following. So you take a look at your real data and just would permute data around. Uh, look at the permutation uh, experiments, multiple permutations, and you can evaluate how frequently you see these two mutations independently hit the same gene. And the problem here, of course, is mutation rate variation because if mutation rate is heterogeneous along the genome, uh, this may be simply a mutational hotspot, which you don't know about. So what we need, we need careful model of local mutation rate. And the problem in cancer is that because of accessibility to specific mutagens or specific genetic changes in repair systems, and I'll be talking about it, uh, you may have a situation where this mutation rate heterogeneity is patient specific, not just cancer type specific, but specific to individual, individual patient. Now, over five years ago, um, we again, in collaboration with John's lab, uh, John's lab uh, made an observation that uh, both density of human SNPs and human chimpanzee divergence is increased in late replicating regions of the genome compared to early replicating regions of the genome. So we have certain epigenomic variables uh, that control potentially mutation rates. So this is stratification of S phase of cell cycle uh, into four um, regions. And we see increase in both divergence and, and polymorphism. So uh, this fueled our interest in, in, uh, in the question. And it turned out that the same effect is observed in cancer genomics. Uh, so uh, here, this is in collaboration with Gary Getz's lab. Uh, we see that there is effect of replication timing uh, in pretty much every single cancer type uh, we analyzed. Uh, so there is increase of mutation density late in replication compared to early in replication. And some genes that are located in late replicating regions are sort of usual false positives of a mutation mapping in, uh, in cancers. Uh, there is another variable, uh, which is uh, level of gene expression. Uh, genes that are expressed at high levels have less mutations in, in cancer genomes. And the standard uh, idea as the culprit is the transcription coupled repair mechanism. And I'll show you the pathway because I'll be, and I'll show it then again because I'll be talking about this pathway throughout, uh, throughout the talk. Uh, so the idea is the following. If there is a lesion in DNA, one of the mechanisms is uh, nucleotide excision repair, which starts with TF2H, which is helicase, and winds DNA. There is excision step in both direction, and there is a resynthesis using the, um, the other strand as, as the template. Now, this mechanism, this is a very accurate repair mechanism, uh, which can be recruited in two different ways. So one way is stalled uh, RNA polymerase. Uh, so if there is a lesion on DNA, transcription cannot proceed forward, and polymerase recruits uh, nucleotide excision repair system downstream. Uh, the other mechanism is what we call global genome repair, is active search by the XPC complex for lesions in, in DNA. So uh, first thing we decided to check is, okay, we think that this mechanism leads to reduction of uh, mutation density in actively uh, transcribed genes. Uh, what happens in active regulatory elements? Uh, we decided to look um, within DNA's one hypersensitive sites. I don't have to introduce them for this audience. Uh, you're all familiar with that. My naive expectation was that mutation density may be elevated because uh, these sites uh, are not protected by nucleosomes, maybe they are more accessible to uh, some sort of damage and so forth. So when we looked at multiple uh, cell types, um, this was published last year, multiple myeloma, colon cancer, melanoma, lung cancer, CLL, and um, uh, this scale depends on the number of samples we had, we see 
reduction in every single cell type, reduction of mutation density within regions of open chromatin. Now, what's important, the effect is very well localized. Uh, I'm not talking megabases or hundreds of KB. This is one kilobase resolution, right? And the um, reduction is compared to immediate flank. And uh, I'm not going through many regression models, how to take into account effect of location, effect of nucleotide composition, uh, mutational spectrum in this cancer type, and so forth. OK, so what uh, can be behind this effect? So we decided to look at one system specifically uh, in a melanoma. And there are several reasons. One is there are multiple samples available. It's uh, high mutation rate cancer. And most importantly, we know the mutation source. We have a signature. And we believe the signature corresponds to UV damage of DNA. Uh, and we know that the major repair mechanism acting on the signature is nucleotide excision repair. So we can make some bio biological hypothesis uh, uh, from looking at the system. OK, so now it's a little more quantitative presentation of the same data. Um, this are intergenic regions. These are intronic regions. We have mutation density. And we have chromatin accessibility uh, in quantitative fashion. This is just number of MAP DNAs, one cleavages. So what we think is this is the action of transcription coupled repair, so the difference between intergenic and intronic regions. However, within each of those, there is very strong dependency on uh, chromatin accessibility. OK, why is this happening? So there are many possibilities. One is that what we're seeing is purifying selection in regulatory elements. So maybe mutations are happening, but negative selection purges them, and we're, we're not seeing them. Uh, so I don't have time to discuss this in detail, but as somebody who unsuccessfully spent now almost three years looking for signatures of purifying selection in cancers, I don't believe in that, right? So in order to uh, assume that this is the case, selection must be dramatically stronger than encoding regions of the genome. We, we, we never observe that. Uh, another possibility is this is association with replication timing or other uh, epigenetic feature, not necessarily uh, specifically with chromatin accessibility. Uh, so we tested it in two ways. You can run multiple multivariate regression models uh, and see that this is not the case. Uh, and also, the scale of the effect is very different. right? So this is a very localized phenomenon. OK, so another possibility is the accessibility to DNA repair. And here, what the hypothesis is, XPC in global genome repair is the large bulky complex, like DNA is one. right? with footprint which is much larger than uh, uh, distance between nucleosomes. Uh, so it has to work uh, in chromatin with chromatinized DNA. And there is active mechanism to, to assist nucleotide excision repair to work on chromatinized DNA. And if you look through experimental literature, the access of DNA repair to naked DNA is always much faster. So again, the idea is that global genome repair uh, may work more efficiently in open DNA compared to chromatinized DNA and recruit the same nucleotide excision repair uh, machinery uh, downstream. Now, even as bioinformaticists, we can test the hypothesis without running any experiments because cancer genomic data, when you look at mutations, you have phenotype and genotype in the same data set. Right? So I have a phenotype. What is the drop of mutation density in DNA's hypersensitive regions? And I have genotype of the tumor. And I have a hypothesis that nucleotide excision repair uh, is, is involved. So we can stratify all our melanoma samples into those where we do not see any change in nucleotide excision repair, which are marked green, or samples where we do observe potentially deactivating mutation anywhere in nucleotide excision repair pathway. And we see that there is statistically significant enrichment of samples with potentially deactivated nucleotide excision repair uh, among samples where the drop in mutation density associated with chromatin accessibility is very small. We can further exploit the structure of the pathway because if mutations deactivating nucleotide excision repair happen downstream, in actual repair part of the pathway, then we should abrogate both effects. 
dependency of mutation density on transcription, uh, so correlation with expression level, and correlation with chromatin. So as we see here, these three samples, for example, uh, where um, uh, mutations happen downstream in these genes and core repair part of the pathway, uh, they have very small or no uh, decrease in mutation density associated with either um, transcription or uh, chromatin accessibility. Unfortunately, we had only one sample. This is sample number four upstream in specifically uh, with mutations specifically in global genome repair. And this fits the hypothesis, but I, I probably wouldn't um, uh, really m make very strong inference from a single, a single sample. Uh, so concluding this part of the talk, uh, we think that mutation density, well, we think, we know, we, we observe that mutation density is markedly reduced in regulatory regions marked by DNA hypersensitive sites. Uh, and the effect is likely mediated by global genome repair, uh, as can be shown by association of this effect with present of, presence of intact nucleotide excision repair pathway in, uh, in, in the sample. Okay, so this is very focal. So what, what, we, what we learned so far? We learned that mutation density uh, in cancers is shifted towards later replicating regions. Regions cancer don't really, doesn't really need because most of expressed genes and active elements are located in early replicating domains. We um, observed that mutation density in cancers is uh, reduced in actively transcribed genes, in genes cancer needs versus genes cancer doesn't need. And we also learned that mutation density is reduced in actively um, active regulatory elements, right? So this is kind of the theme. So these are primarily observations, especially on expression and uh, DNA's one accessibility uh, with specifically within functional, potentially functional elements. So what happens if we uh, change resolution and we'll look at the megabase scale and we use the data collected by the epigenome roadmap consortium from multiple um, cell types uh, and uh, multiple uh, ep uh, epigenomic variables. So first, again, looking at, um, looking at variation in DNA's uh, one hypersensitivity, just density of peaks per megabase versus number of mutations. Again, I use melanoma as an example, and I use classic uh, UV-induced mutation um, density. There's pretty good correlation. However, uh, one interesting feature we, um, we noted is the following. So I can look at three different skin cell types, uh, melanocytes, fibroblasts, and keratinocytes. And I see that there is decrease in mutation density associated with um, density of um, open chromatin regions in each of the three cell types. However, in melanocytes, this decrease is much more profound. Right, the correlation coefficient, negative correlation coefficient is, uh, is much greater. Uh, the general phenomenon, uh, again, is that activating marks are anti-correlated with mutation density and repressive marks are positively correlated with mutation density. Again, uh, places where cancer doesn't need uh, functional genes to work have reduced density of mutations. And I'll come back to that point. Now, back to uh, specific cell types. So if I take, for example, uh, mutations in liver cancers and information uh, about uh, now methylation marks in liver and information about melanocytes, and I would also look at melanoma mutations, what I observe is that if I condition to the right cell type, the other cell type carries no information, right? So if I check liver cancer and melanoma, and I check um, uh, data on uh, methylation in liver cells, hepatocytes, and melanocytes, uh, if I would know about melanocytes, liver cells add no information to mutation density in melanoma. If I would know about liver cells, melanocytes don't add any information to mutation density um, in uh, liver cancer. Okay, so now these are observations. They hint at the importance of features. They hint uh, multiple features. They hint into the importance of correct cell type. Now, what are we going to do? We have highly dimensional data set. Now, for some reason, uh, postdocs involved in the study like random forest regression. And I know there are many methods, probably uh, many bioinformaticists in the room like other methods. 
uh, but I just follow um, POSIX in the study. Uh, so POS and ROSA selected random forest regression for the analysis. Uh, machine learning methods, so what you do, you throw everything into it. And we show that we can actually predict mutation density per megabase with uh, fairly remarkable accuracy. Uh, not every cancer, uh, but it's uh, over 80% of variants uh, can be explained in a um, in, in whole bunch of uh, cancer types. Now, because it's random forest, you can look at um, the features that uh, contribute to this classifier. And this is the pattern. So if we look at melanoma, I see some epithelial cells, but most of the features come from melanocytes. Uh, if I move to liver, and this is, of course, a small chunk of very large metrics like this, right? So I would um, look at what features uh, significantly contribute to the predictor for liver cells, and these features come from liver cells. Uh, then uh, I would look at uh, colon cancer, and uh, it, there is the same match, uh, multiple myeloma, and so forth. There is one cancer where it doesn't work, and I think probably we didn't have the right cell type, is lung cancer. So in lung cancer, this, this trick didn't work. Okay, now I can do the following trick. I can take all of my features and cluster them by gene, and I can look at for which of the tissues collectively, what is the variance explained by the classifier um, if I take only the relevant cell type versus all the relevant tissues and cell types? And again, for melanoma, I see that I can explain most of variation looking only at melanocytes. The effect is not as dramatic, but uh, also I can select the right uh, cell type in liver cancer and so on. So looking at this, what we decided to do, we decided to develop a simple classifier. So now, now we're turning this on its head. So what I told you so far is this. Uh, there are regions of the genome where genes are expressed, where chromatin is active. These regions have less mutations than regions uh, which are heterochromatic, latent replication, uh, not associated with uh, active chromatin and transcription. Uh, and uh, I told you that looking at epigenomic data, if you have the right cell type, you can actually predict mutation profile uh, over the megabase. So now what we decided to do, we decided to turn it on its head because uh, we can develop a predictor of cell type of origin of cancer from mutational data. So I look at the genome and I scan a database of epigenome roadmap and I'm trying to predict what is the cell, which is cell of origin of this cancer, right? Again, we never ran the true experiment taking uh, tumors of unknown primary, predicting and acting on them clinically. This wasn't done. So what we did, we did a very simple um, experiment. We took uh, individual samples from our data sets, and we developed a classifier, again, looking at uh, significant features that explain variation uh, of mutation rate along megabase. And what we see, for most of cancers, uh, we predict with overall accuracy of 88% um, what is the right cell type. Uh, we do not predict lung cancer, as I mentioned. Uh, again, probably we don't have the right uh, epigenomic profile. Uh, there was almost an anecdote with uh, esophageal cancer because uh, the original cell type which the algorithm selected we believed is a false positive. Uh, but then looking at the literature, we realized that um, these are exact cells that people believe give rise to esophageal cancer. So at least with some reasonable accuracy, this trick works. Okay, so now there is an important question. Uh, the important question is, uh, these are uh, cells of origin. And we heard today about epigenomic modification due to cancer progression. This was my original thinking. And this is this whole talk about failures of my original hypothesis, by the way. So my original thinking was the following. We observed that cancer avoids mutations in, in regions it needs mutations. We know that this is uh, determined by epigenomic profile. 
now we can think about evolution of mutation rate, and this is what we're doing on theoretical side of things, which I don't have time to present. And you may think about the following idea. Okay, so I, cancer starts frequently at high mutation rate background, then mutations keep, keep happening, uh, and of course, um, you know, many of these mutations may potentially be deleterious for, for the tumor. There would be selection um, to suppress these mutations. If you look at expression data, both base excision repair system and nucleotide excision repair systems are overexpressed late in melanoma compared to early melanoma. So I thought that this is active selection on mutation rate, right, to eliminate mutations where, where tumor needs them. So then we asked the following question, and we didn't have plenty of data, but uh, there are two cell types where we did have data. So we can take, we can see how mutation density is predicted by epigenomic features of liver cells versus epigenomic features of liver cancer cell cells, right? And what we see is that we can predict much better using liver cells than um, liver cancer cells. In melanoma, there is even, even more interesting experiment because we take the same cell line and we can see that all peaks in cell line that don't predict as well as all peak within melanocytes. But if we take peaks specific to cell line or specific to melanocytes, these are pretty much non-predictive and melanocyte peaks that are not observed in cancer still predict mutation density. I found it very surprising. I think one possible explanation is a lot of mutations we observe in tumors actually arise very early uh, before uh, epigenomic re uh, <coughs> changes associated with, uh, with cancer. Okay, so I see John standing there, so I'm going to my conclusion slide. Um, basically, again, mutation density at one megabase in cancer is very strongly associated with chromatin organization. Uh, this association is very highly specific with respect to cell of origin. Uh, and it looks like cancer genome has enough information uh, about cell of origin so you can actually predict what is the uh, cell of origin based on, on cancer genome. Uh, thanking my lab. Uh, so this is how seriously we think about our projects. Uh, Pas Polek, who recently left the lab, contributed to uh, most of this. Uh, so he's here listed with the lab members, and of course, uh, thanks going to uh, John Stamatanopoulos and Bob Thurman, and to Rosa Karlik and Anand Koren, who were our collaborators. Thank you. Fabulous. Do you think that the tumors are actively actively going at silencing some of these mutations in order to transit from a normal state to a tumor state? If indeed the mutations are more likely to arise in the normal tissue, is that an active process? Uh, so, so I'm a little bit in disarray with my thinking right now. So my original thinking was that uh, if you look at mathematical models of evolution of mutation rate, you find that in asexual systems, um, selection and mutation rate is much more efficient than in sexual systems. So in principle, cancer would have the ability to change mutation rate, especially if, if uh, what we're seeing is cell type specific, uh, to silence mutations in regions where it needs. And I, I found this model intellectually pleasing. I don't think this is what we're observing. I think what we're observing possibly is the very simple fact that most of cancer is clonal, and most of these mutations possibly accumulated very early in, um, like, before, uh, before cancer progression. Uh, but tell you the truth, by now I don't know. I don't have any good model anymore. Uh, fantastic. So I was wondering, you know, in the later part of the talk, you said um, the uh, correlation with when you get the chromatin states from tissues versus cancers. The cancers that you show us are cell lines. So is, is it, is that, would, would that be a factor that cell, cell lines are very selected and they probably have very selected traumatic states, very different from what the original cancer would be? Yeah, so your mutation rate would be better if you take directly can, cancer tissues than cancer cell lines? Uh, this may be the case. So in principle, uh, if there is epigenetic control of mutation rate, I would be surprised that it would be different in cell lines compared to cancers. But the, but the observation is absolutely correct. So the uh, main results on the paper were done on uh, primary tumors, and the last couple slides uh, were comparison with, with cell line data, and we didn't have matching data sets, so uh, that's, that's of course a deficiency. Uh, 
but I do not see an obvious hypothesis why uh, there would be a substantial difference because uh, cell lines have been there for a reasonably long time and if mutations are, uh, keep happening and would be associated with, uh, with epigenomics of cell lines, we, we, sh we should observe that. And I have another question. It's a very general question. So it's been known in the field and very, very much propagated by, uh, for, for over, over many years that the mutation rate is constant between cancer cells and normal mutation rate. So what, can you comment on that? What is it now? Where does it stand? Uh, it's, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting question. So um, I think there is disagreement within the field. Uh, whether mutation rate is elevated during uh, in, in cancer or it's not elevated. Um, so people who believe that it, it is elevated, they point to A, uh, a lot of uh, mutator genes uh, associated with uh, cancer, both germline predisposition and these are early events in cancer. For example, we see a lot of samples in melanoma with changes in nucleotide excision repair pathways. Theoretically, it uh, fits very well. Uh, because you would have change in mutator and would hitchhike with, to, together with uh, cancer drivers. Um, now, there are people who don't really believe that there is substantial difference. Um, and uh, especially if you look at mutation density, if a lot of these events happen early, people point to uh, dependency um, uh, on age of diagnosis and this type of observations. Uh, I don't have a strong opinion either way. Uh, I find arguments of increased mutation rate very logical. Uh, and I also, I'm happy to live in the world where uh, it's, it's gray. S in some cases, especially when you have mutator mutations, mutation rate may be elevated, and in other cases, uh, m maybe it's the same. You just hit randomly driver, driver gene. Thanks.